Hey everybody, so this is going to be a quick video over uh, the importance of making comparable groups and how we can make comparable groups when we're conducting uh, experiments. So I'm going to share my screen with you. There we go. All right. So a little uh, PowerPoint for you. Maybe it'll help you uh, follow along. All right. So let's get right into it. So remember that when we want to make a causal claim, one of the three requirements is that we can't have an any alternative explanations for any difference that we might find. So again, let's you know put this in the context of a simple experiment where we're manipulating one IV, we're measuring one DV, and our IV only has two conditions. So we have an experimental and a control condition. In order for us to say that our IV causes anything, causes any kind of change in our DV, we have to satisfy the three requirements of a causal claim. And I go over these in depth, or a little bit more depth, in one of uh, my other videos. Be sure to check that out. But for here, we're going to focus on the uh, ruling out alternative hypotheses. The other two, of course, are uh, ensuring temporal precedence and make, ensuring covariation. But put those aside. Let's say that we've already, we're manipulating our IV prior to measuring our DV, so temporal precedence is satisfied. And let's assume that um, <clears throat> the two are correlated. Okay, so now how do we satisfy that third requirement of ruling out alternative hypotheses? Well, the logic of an, of an experiment is that we do this by making every other alternative hypothesis no, by, by, by ruling them out. And we do this by making sure everything other than our, than our IV that, that we're manipulating, everything other than the condition that our participants uh, receive before uh, completing our measure of our DV is identical. All right, so there's a ton of things. Well, bef before I go on to that, um, so you know, let's put this in the context of an experiment or an example experiment. So let's say I wanted to manipulate rejection and I wanted to say that, that affected uh, self esteem. So our IV is rejection, control uh, in the control condition, they receive no rejection, in the experimental condition, they're rejected, and then in the, we're measuring everybody receives the same measure of self esteem. Okay, now. A lot of different things could push people's self-esteem around. I mean, a lot of things. All right, their optimism, their history, their uh, the history of negative events in their life, uh, their social support, um, their uh, rumination uh, habits. Seriously, tons and tons of different things could affect their self-esteem measure. So. Then, and in fact, many times when I'm talking about research uh, uh, and experiments in my classes, I'll often have students bring up, well, what about if they just blah, and they insert some subject variable, an individual difference variable, all right? Well, <clears throat> that is a potential alternative explanation if certain uh, practices of experimental control have not been taken. Okay, so we, we, we use certain methods of experimental control to rule out all these subject variables or all any other alternative explanation. All of these alternative explanations are threats to our internal validity, our ability to truthfully say that our IV affected change in our DV. Okay, so we use these methods of experimental control uh, methodological and statistical, but in this video, we're just going to talk about methodological, uh, to rule out those alternative competing hypotheses. Now, the two main types of methodological control are holding things constant and balancing. So holding, thing con holding things constant refers to when in an experiment, we try to make everything in that experiment other than the conditions of our IV, all right, the same, okay? I'm gonna talk more about that in a little bit. Balancing is a method of, uh, is a tactic of methodological control in which we try to make sure that uh, subject variables, like those ones we were talking about with self-esteem earlier, like uh, optimism or experience, negative life experiences, we try to balance those out among our groups because we want our two groups to be identical. 
If we, if we can make our two groups on average identical in every subject variable, in every um, uh, uh, external condition, if we can make our two groups identical in those regards, then none of those individual difference variables or subject variables, environmental conditions, none of those can be used as alternative explanations. If we keep the experiences of the two groups identical in every way, except for the condition that we're manipulating, then those differences aren't alternative explanations. So holding constant rules out any differences between the two conditions, and balancing rules out any threats caused by differences between our participants. So we're going to talk about in this video those two kinds of methodological control. Again, holding constant is making sure everything other than the IV, the two conditions, the two the levels of the IV are the same. That's holding constant. And val uh, in our so holding everything in our procedure, in our study, in the two conditions the same except the two levels of the IV. And then balancing is when we try to uh, assign equivalent numbers of individuals with various different qualities and experiences. We try to assign equivalent numbers of uh, those individuals in every one of our conditions. All right, so let's talk about holding constant first. All right, so again, right, when we're holding constant, we want to make sure that the experience, that the experiences that our participants in every single one of our conditions, our experimental condition, our control condition, if we, have an, if we have an independent variable with three levels or more, we want to make sure that the participants' experiences in every one of those conditions are identical except for our IV. We want the only differences between the, uh, the experiences of each of those conditions to be the levels of our IV. Everything else, we want to hold constant. So for example, let's say that in the experimental condition, you're having um, participants read a abstract, let's say you're doing a study on the effects of abstraction on memory, right? So you, in, in the experimental condition, you're having people read an abs a, a, a uh, passage, a little story that's very abstract, right? But in the experimental or in the control condition, you're having them read a passage or a story that's very concrete. Right, abstract. So that you're talking about very uh, uh, hard to uh, think about, dis uh, unfamiliar concepts, concepts that you can't point at a thing and say that's it. All right, that's abstract. Concrete, however, is very nuts and bolts. It, if if something's concrete, you can point at it and say that's the thing. All right. So. Um, <clears throat> You know, I can talk about language in abstract terms. It's a system of communication, but I can also talk about language in very concrete terms. English is language. German is language, etc. <clears throat> or examples of language. All right. So let's go back to our reading test example. So we want to see how abstraction affects memory, right? So we have an experimental condition where they're reading an abstract passage and a control condition where they're reading a concrete passage. Well, what if our abstract passage is three times longer than our concrete passage? If that's the case, then we've created a confound. We've created a threat to internal validity. All threats to internal validity are confounds. We've created a situation where, yes, maybe if we find any difference in memory, yeah, it might be due to abstraction, the fact that one passage was abstract and the other was concrete, but it also may be due to the fact that the abstract passage was three times longer. So if I'm giving them a reading task, I would want to make both passages equally long so that the length of the passage doesn't become a confound, doesn't become a threat to my internal validity. All right. So in that way, I'm keeping the experiences of the people in my abstract reading condition and my concrete reading condition similar. I'm making them both read for an equivalent amount of time. <clears throat> or at least I'm uh, making sure that they read an equivalently long passage. All right. What about a self-regulation test? So let's say, you know, in one condition, I'm having participants read through a passage and they have to mark out every letter E that they see in the passage, right? Well, in the other condition, you know, I might just have them read the passage. Well, so I've, I've satisfied the fact that 
you know, that they're reading the exact same passage and I'm just having them control one and the other. But now other differences between those con two conditions might pop up like the average amount of time it takes. And that becomes a confound. So we would have to do things to make that uh, aspect of the two groups experiences equivalent. Um, because again, we want to make sure that the only difference, the only difference in the experiences of our two conditions is our IP, right? the thing that we're manipulating. Everything else we want to keep constant, okay? We want to hold it constant. What about the stimuli, all right? Because, uh, you know, sometimes for a number of reasons, we'll be showing participant stimuli and we'll ask them to react to it. So for example, in a lexical decision task. In a lexical decision task, we ask participants uh, to decide whether or not a string of letters that we show them on a computer screen is a word or not. And so we might show them the word kale, K-A-L-E, right? And they have to decide as quickly as possible whether that's a word. And if it is, click, uh, press a button that indicates yes. And if it's not, click a button that, set, that indicates no, it's not. And we want them to do that as quickly as possible. Well, we want to make sure that our words, kale, cat, dog, dad, are equivalent to our non-words, X, L, E, J, uh, F, B, T, R. Uh, we want to make sure that our words are as close to equivalent to our non-words in every regard with the exception that our non-words are not words, right? So we want to make sure that they're similar in their constant, consonant and values, right? So, you know, if, if the average word has two con in our list has two consonants, two vowels, we want to make sure that in our non-words that the average word has on average two consonant, two vowels. Uh, if, there, if, if our average real word is four uh, letters long, then we want to make sure that our non-words are on average four letters long. Um, the shape of the words need to be similar to the shape of the non-words. Uh, so like if you were to outline each word, you'd want it to have roughly similar outlines. Um, uh, you want the letter order convention, the orthography of the uh, letters or the, the words and non-words to be similar. All right. But again, you want only the fact that the words are words and the non-words are not to be the only difference. All right. Everything else you want to hold constant. Okay. Uh, what if we're having uh, person targets, right? So we might say, well, we're looking at, um, you know, emotional expression in the face, right? Well, if you care about how the race of the person might affect people's interpretation of their emotional expression, if you care about how the sex of the person might affect their, the emotional, the emotion we see on their face, if you care about those qualities, then certainly you would manipulate that. But if you don't care, if that's not the variable you're looking at in your particular study, then you want to keep those things constant, all right? Keep all the targets the same race, keep all the targets the same sex. Now, there are research questions where you might care how the effect of the face affects the interpretation of the emotion, how the, I think the sex, sorry, there are uh, research questions where you might care about whether the sex of the face might affect the emotion that people see on it. There are situations where you, where you might want to know whether the race of the face affects the emotion people see on it. The, these are legitimate uh, research questions, but if those aren't questions that you're asking, then keep them constant. Show everybody the same race target, show everybody the same sex target, all right? <clears throat> um, I guess gender target would actually be a better, gender and sex are different constructs. That's a video for a different time. Uh, but the point is you want to keep everything about your targets the same, just like with the lexical decision test. You want to keep everything about your targets, in that case, the word versus non-word, the same, all right? By holding these things constant, constant, then any kind of differences between the two conditions are hold, held constant. So there are no differences. We want to make sure that there are, as, as best we can, we want to try and make sure that there are no differences between the two conditions, except, except for the IV that will manipulate, all right? <clears throat> now, do we want to hold everything constant? Do we want to keep the, the, the room temperature for both conditions constant? The age of the participants 
constant. The month of data collection, constant. Well, yeah, maybe. If that provides an alternative explanation. If the month, if the age, if the room temperature, if these things don't provide a legitimate alternative explanation, then, then they're not a threat to internal validity in the first place. And so it doesn't matter if you hold them constant or not. Now, luckily, um, <clears throat> if you do your best to hold things constant, most of these things probably won't matter anyway. And if you do other techniques like balancing, some of the other things might not matter anyway. But um, we only really care about holding something constant if it provides an alternative explanation. Now, not always do we have a reason, right, uh, that some to think that something might provide an alternative explanation. So in general, the cautious, the safe thing to do is to hold as many things as you can constant, all right? Um, but if holding something constant or balancing something potentially harms some other aspect of your study that's more essential, then focus on the more essential piece. Prioritize the more essential pieces of your study over the less essential pieces, all right? Any, any potential threat to an alternative explanation is important to consider, but you, what you can't control for in one study, you can in a second. And so you, replication is always crucial. So you know, control as much as you can in one study, but you can't because you need to do something else that's more important, make up for in a second study. All right, so holding constant is one method of making comparable groups. The second method is by balancing, all right? So, you know, I listed a couple things here, you know, like age of the participant, right? That's, an act, that's actually a subject variable. And holding constant is not something, we're not gonna be able to hold anything constant about the, the studies to, to balance out participants' age. So, Instead, we use techniques known as balancing techniques, all right? So we want to make sure that the participants, because again, we, we want our groups in an experiment to be as close to identical as freaking possible, right? So if we hold, if we hold the experiences of each study constant, we've accomplished, uh, we've accomplished making our groups identical in their experiences. But now we've got to make sure that our groups are identical in terms of their individual qualities, all right, in terms of their subject variables. Well, <clears throat> how do we make sure that our two groups are balanced, that the subject variables are balanced equally among both of our conditions or all of our conditions? Well, we can't control our participants. We can't change our participants. What we can do is change the distribution of our participants, all right? We can change the makeup, the distribution of subject variables Across our, across our groups, all right? <clears throat> and again, that will allow us to have comparable groups because both groups will be roughly identical in terms of these subject variables. Now, uh, one of the most common and widely used, and arguably I would say that it should be used in every study that you can use it in, uh, techniques of balancing is random assignment. This is when you have your sample, Excuse me, and then you randomly assign your participants to each condition. All right. So, if you randomly assign appropriately, then none of the individual differences, because again, I think I mentioned earlier, very often when I'm talking about studies in my classes, my students will come up with these subject variables. Well, what about if they're just happy? Well, what if, you know, what if they have negative events? You know, whatever. If the study has used random assignment, and almost every study that can use it does, then both conditions, all conditions, are going to have an equal number of happy people, an equal number of sexes, an equal number of genders, an equal number of extroverts, an equal number of aggressive folks, an equal number of insert any subject variable you care about. If you've properly randomly, randomly assigned, then, then none of these individual differences will matter. They, when I say they won't matter, they always matter. But what I mean is they won't be potential alternative explanations because every condition, every level of your IV will have an equivalent number of those folks. So they won't have a disproportionate, they won't have an, uh, an unbalanced effect on any one of the conditions. 
All right. Now, does random assign Simon always work? No. All right. Because it is random. All right. We often think, and this is one of, uh, this is a uh, cognitive quirk of humans. We often think that randomness looks orderly. All right. We often think that if we randomly assign, um, you know, it would, it, it, let's say I randomly assigned people the two conditions. Well, we would assume that it would look like one zero one zero one zero one zero one zero one zero one zero. That's not random. All right. Instead, randomness comes in spurts. All right. So something that would look random would look more like one 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 zero one zero one 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 zero 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 one 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 zero one zero 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 one 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 one. So it would come in spurts. All right. So randomness, truly random, doesn't look random to us. But because of the true nature of randomness, randomness, because again, remember, randomness comes in spurts, right? So if it's zero 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 one one zero zero one 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 zero zero zero, right? Depending on our sample size, the sample size that we use determines where we cut off that 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 those spurts, all right? And then if we just look at what we've got, we might have an unbalanced sample, all right? So yes, in any one study, random assignment can fail. This is why we replicate. All right, because if you replicate a study enough times, then random assignment does work. All right, the more samples you have, and the more, and if you randomly assign every time, then across all of those studies, everything's balanced out. All right, this is why you never want to take a single study as great evidence for something. All right, a single study is always a first step. It's a little bit of evidence. It's not definitive. One study will never prove anything. In fact, I would argue nothing ever proves anything, but we can have a lot of evidence for something or a little of evidence for something. And one study only ever provides you with a little bit of evidence for something. You want a wealth of studies. So for example, in my field uh, uh, of social psychology, the, the, the area that I'm an evolutionary social psychologist, but I most of the stuff I read is in just social psychology, or at least it was in grad school. And in social psych, we it's it's frowned upon heavily to try and publish a single study publication, all right, because of the reasons I just told you, all right. As far back as the 70s, our flagship journal, the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology, um, no longer accepted single study publications. In fact, I don't think I've ever seen one in that in that journal in particular, and very rarely in other journals. All right. Um, so, <clears throat> yes, random assignment can fail in one study, but if you replicate it and you replicate it many times, random assignment does the job. Well, an alternative to random assignment, an alternative method of balancing is matching. This is when we pretest a sample, and then we choose people from that from uh, that pre-tested sample so that we can ensure and we balance them on the qualities we care about, right? So we can make sure that people in each of our conditions are equal age, equal in their self-esteem, equal in the negative life events, equal in all these other things. So we're essentially forcing balancing, all right? But pre-testing comes with a lot of potential problems. All right. Um, now, if your first observation when you pre-tested them comes long before your second observation when you do your actual study, then you know a lot of these problems aren't really a problem. All right. Um, but if you tried to pre-test them in the study, all right, and then assign them based on that, that can create a whole host of problems, which I'll talk about in a uh, different video. So matching is another method of balancing. It's an alternative to random, assign random assignment. It's matched assignment. This is when, again, you pretest them and then assign them to group based on the qualities that you want them to be balanced on. And that, my friends, is that. All right, guys, that's it for this video. Um, as always, if you have any questions, let me know. But in this video, we talked about 
uh, balance, we talked about methods of methodological control. So we talked about balancing, we talked about holding constant, and we talked about how those help us generate comparable groups. All right, and again, we want comparable groups so that we can achieve that third aspect that we need, that third condition we need for making a causal claim, which is ruling out alternative hypotheses. So by holding constant, holding every aspect of our studies constant, and by balancing the external qualities and the subject qualities uh, between our conditions, we can rule out most, if not all, alternative explanations. All right, guys, that's it for this video. As always, if you have questions, let me know. If not, then I'll see you later.